The first reading comes from Ezekiel 17, verses 22 through 24. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel I will plant it in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it every kind of bird will live in the shade of its branches, will nest wing creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree, I make high the low tree, I dry up the green tree and make dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. The Gospel reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 26 to 34. Listen to the word of God. He also said, For the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in the shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Greetings to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm happy also to bring you greetings on behalf of the National Setting of the United Church of Christ and global ministries of the UCC and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. It is an honor and privilege for me to be with you this morning. And I want to begin by expressing gratitude to you for your commitments to God's mission through the church and your generosity to our church's wider mission and one great hour of sharing, which make possible the ministries of many people and partners in the U.S. and throughout the world, including a vital witness of hope in places of need in the Middle East. I know that partners in the region are encouraged by and thankful for the vibrant engagement of so many UCC members and congregations. I'm especially grateful to your pastor, Reverend Dr. Wilson, for the opportunity to share with you in worship this morning and to participate earlier in the educational forum on Israel-Palestine. I have come to know Bernard closely and personally as a co-traveler during the leadership delegation to the Middle East this past April and May. I have great respect for him as a UCC leader and as a pastor. He represented you and all of us with integrity as we engaged with our denominational partners in Jordan, Israel-Palestine, Egypt, and Lebanon over those two weeks. In my position with the UCC and Global Ministries, I have responsibilities for nurturing our denominational partnerships in the Middle East and Europe churches, ecumenical councils, and faith-based organizations are among our partners. 
I also supervise our missionaries who are sent to serve with some of those partners. And I bring the voices of our partners in the regions to our churches in the UCC by speaking about the issues they face and sharing about their work and ministries. The Middle East, of course, is where the three major world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, emerged. The region is often perceived as Islamic, and the majority of the populations are indeed Muslim. But not all Middle Easterners are Muslim, and most Muslims don't even actually leave, live in Arab countries. The first congregational missionaries to the Middle East, Eli Parsons and Pliny Fisk, learned this when they encountered the Christian communities of the Middle East over the course of their missionary careers. Parsons and Fisk left Boston for the Ottoman Empire in 1819 under the charge of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, which was established here in Connecticut 205 years ago. That first North American mission board is wider church ministries of the UCC today. The scriptures tell us that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and that the first church was established in Jerusalem by James. So our faith heritage connects us to the Christians of the region who have been there for two millennia. The first Christian missionaries in the Middle East were certainly not Parsons and Fisk in the 19th century. Instead, they were Peter and Thomas, Mark, Paul, and Barnabas, among others, who went out from the Eastern Mediterranean to today's Iraq, Iran, and India, Egypt, Syria, and Turkey, and Greece, and Rome. Little did they know the extent of the impact they would have on the region and on the world as they spread their experience with and faith in Jesus and shared that message wide and far. Their commitments and efforts sowed the seeds of the major strands of historic Christianity in the world. That tiny community of faith, with God's help, became something great. We in the UCC are therefore connected to the people and the issues of the Middle East today by our tie of history and continuity with the historic church. Today, the Christians of the Middle East are about 15 million. We are also therefore connected through Christian kinship and mission and partner relations with Christians, churches, and faith-based organizations in the region. And the United Church of Christ is a church that takes a special interest in advocating for peace and justice globally and here in the US. We are particularly involved in the quest for justice for the people of the Middle East especially in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian content, and so are engaged there through our solidarity with Christians and all people who seek peace with justice for all of the people of the region. This morning's lectionary reading from the Hebrew scriptures is from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was one of the major prophets, along with Isaiah and Jeremiah, and lived about the same time as Jeremiah. It is believed that he, like Jeremiah, witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem and the exile to Babylon, which he prophesied. The passage we read this morning is poetic and describes the power of God to restore the earth and creation after its demise. God says, I will plant a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar on a high and lofty mountain in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Every kind of bird will live under it, and all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. The text, by itself, reveals the awesome power of God and the great dominion of God over all creatures. Such a small sprig, a tiny branch cut off from its source of nourishment, the rooted tree that it comes from, through which water and nutrients from the soil is brought, would dry up and die. With God's care, it can grow, flourish, and bear fruit, provide shade, and become a nesting and home for every kind of creature. From death to life, the branch is nurtured. The image is hopeful, inspiring, and beautiful. 
But how might that branch have become separated? Why is restoration needed? In the early verses of this chapter, Ezekiel anticipates the exile of the Israelites from Jerusalem to Babylon. He tells a story describing a rebellion against the ruler who made a covenant with the people. Ezekiel asks if it is possible for the covenant to be broken without consequences. He writes, can he break the covenant and yet escape? Of course, Ezekiel's answer is a resounding no. Because he despised the oath and broke the covenant, he shall not escape. I will spread my net over him, and he shall be caught in my snare. I will bring him into Babylon and enter into judgment with him there for the treason he has committed against me. So, the restoration of creation and of the people is a necessity. The story Ezekiel tells is allegorical, but it points to the exile the Israelites would experience in Babylon as a result of their disobedience and hubris. As a, re as a result, they require restoration, and perhaps that can come when they remember that God alone is sovereign, not them or their worldly accomplishments. How we read this story has implications for how we think about God's covenant with Abraham, the promise of land for him and for his descendants. Most scholars present that covenant as unconditional, but then what do we make of the Babylonian exile Ezekiel experienced? Palestinian Catholic Archbishop Elias Shakur I think said it well when he states that God is not a real estate agent. But God does expect the loyalty of God's people and our obedience to God's commandments and that God will do what is necessary to remind us of that. How many times do we break covenant with God as individuals and as communities? How often do we separate ourselves from God? As human beings, we are flawed. We sin, and we need confession and redemption. The world around us does not reflect always God's ideal community. Just consider the state of race relations in our country today, especially in the wake of the events in Ferguson, Cleveland, New York, and Baltimore. Or take the great economic disparities that divide people and communities from each other. And then there are the violent conflicts and wars. When Bernard and I visited the Middle East with the delegation of UCC and Disciples leaders, we experienced many especially poignant moments. One such was an encounter with Syrian and Iraqi refugees in Jordan. For Syrians, nonviolent protests began in January 2011 with hope, but became violent just two months later. The crisis in Syria is now a very long four and a half years. Early on, it was primarily a struggle between Syrian opposition groups of various stripes and the Syrian regime. Last summer, though, the Islamic State, or ISIS, or ISIL, became much more prominently involved, complicating the war immensely and expanding it back into Iraq. The numbers are stark. According to the United Nations, more than half of the Syrian population 12.2 million Syrians are in need of humanitarian assistance. More than 8 million Syrians are internally displaced, and almost 4 million have fled the country, including more than 1.2 to Lebanon, 1 million to Turkey, and more than 600,000 each to Jordan and Iraq. More than 220,000 have perished, and so many are widowed, orphaned, and lost. I know the statistics can be dizzying, but each number represents a human being, a story of a life that has been turned upside down, hopes and dreams that have been destroyed or at least indefinitely interrupted. The Syrians and the Iraqis we met are now waiting for whatever the next chapter in life might be in a new country, currently hosted and supported by an Armenian Catholic congregation in Amman, Jordan. The individuals and families who spoke with us opened their hearts to us. Without knowing us, they shared their deeply personal stories of exile and pain, vulnerab vulnerably opening their hearts. 
They described the lives they had before being threatened with death. They witnessed children being kidnapped for ransom. They told of the threats against women who are simply wearing makeup. They had very little choice but to leave home and on short notice. They wept as they remembered and as they realized once again that there is little hope of returning home. One of our delegation asked the Syrians and Iraqis what they pray for. Some of their responses were predictable in their deep sincerity. Help for the people in need, safety and security for themselves and their families, including those still in Syria and Iraq. They pray for patience as the future is so uncertain and for peace. In addition, one man said that he prays for forgiveness. And I wasn't sure if he meant for himself or for those who are committing the atrocities. And there was one person whose prayer I think especially moved us all. He said that he asks God that the enemy doesn't experience all the pain and suffering that he himself has seen. Pain and suffering that is surely immense. To want revenge would be human. To pray to God to keep one's enemy from experiencing such pain and suffering is a recognition that each person is God's creation, even the enemy. Such a prayer is more than turning the other cheek. It is petitioning to God to preserve the well-being, indeed the humanity, of the other person. Such a prayer is more than an individual's lone act of forgiveness. It is one person's recognition that God remains sovereign. And who knows what the result of that tiny but mighty prayer might be. In a small way, because of our commitment to God's community and love for the world, we in the UCC are supporting those who have been impacted by the war by providing food, water, clothing, and medical assistance. We pray for peace and justice in Syria and the Middle East knowing that God heeds those prayers. Each of the two parables from Mark's Gospel that we read compares seeds to the kingdom of God. Seeds start small, but grow to become much more than what they are at first. I think that our participation in God's mission resembles the seeds Jesus described. This mission history is long, starting with the first followers of Jesus the first missionaries. They had no idea what impact their sincere efforts to spread the message would have. But as we know, the impact was great, such that nearly one-third of the world's population is Christian. And the first congregational missionaries in the Middle East, Southern Asia, and elsewhere had a significant impact on Christianity in the countries to which they traveled. Mission is not only about the sending of missionaries, but it is about building relationships and nurturing those partnerships across time and geography. The ways we connect with the church and world do not usually make the headlines, but we are assured that mission does touch the lives of people in significant ways. Participation in mission starts with prayer. A Syrian man in Amman who prayed to God that his enemy would not see or experience what he did, is a form of mission, just as our prayers for peace and justice are. We pray that our faith, we pray out of our faith and out of a concern and care for sisters and brothers, created like us in God's image. When we pray for someone or for some situation, we express concern and interest and through that, begin to learn more about people and situations. With learning comes engagement. Engagement can be financial, and it can involve advocacy for rights, for a change in policy that could bring about greater justice. Our efforts are like those seeds. They may seem tiny, but they are great, and become greatest when we recognize that mission is not ours. It is God's mission through the church, and we participated in it with so many other people around the city, country, and globe. We are in covenant with God and with each other. 
It is a precious covenant and premised on our relationship with God and our neighbors. Jesus told us that the greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart and mind and strength and our neighbors as ourselves. Whether that neighbor is in Cleveland, Weston, or the Middle East, the commandments and covenant are binding. We can be the seeds, but it is God who brings low the high tree and makes high the low tree. God dries up the green tree and makes the dry tree flourish. And it is God who will make it greatest. Amen.